we go. All right, team, we got Bryant Lowry in the house today. The deep pleasure of having such a talent like this. I'm so excited about this. Please be ready, for you are about to be blown away by this guy's music. He's all over the place, has a storied career. And, uh, well, as you know, I like to celebrate people that are on top of their game. And so here we are with Mr. Bryant Lowry. If you have any questions, please ask right away if it's something that... You'd like to know about his setup or anything like that uh ableton questions you can go ahead and wait till the end so i'm gonna let you take it away fine sir thank you for your time cool thanks man um am i am i screen sharing now should i go ahead and do that yeah yeah please oh okay. if you want to uh, what are we talking about today what's the situation so today we're going to run over my my workflow for uh when i'm when i'm asked to compose a track or if i get a reference track um I'll take that track and I'll shape it to my own. And really it's about effectively moving as quickly as possible while making a quality pro product. So I have brought two tracks today. Um, I am gonna show you the product on both and then maybe go back step and show you like what I liked about the other product that they sent me reference track wise and then how I got to where I, where I have a final product that I sent in. Um, so what's best, should I, should I just play some of this track and then start talking about it? Yeah, I say we. Um, it's up to you. Play all of it in the beginning or all of it at the end, just so we can get a real sense of all the dynamics. And your mixes are super solid, so I I think people would appreciate it. So I'll um I'll play through the first big guitar line, uh, just so you get a, a vibe. Now, just for reference, I was asked to make some. Uh, if you if any of you have been fans of like Mick Gordon, I've been asked to make some like Doom Eternal. Uh, video game, real serious rock and EDM type stuff mixed. Um, and so this is one of those attempts. Um, and uh, so I, I had to combine like some elements of dubstep with elements of like hard rock. Uh, so you're going to hear a little bit of guitar, you're going to hear a little bit of dubstep and then some drums that kind of do a fine line between EDM and real drums. And I'll talk down how I got all those. So here we go. Um, that sounds Maybe I should check that, huh? Yeah, yeah. Maybe you know what? Let's just do a quick reshare. I've noticed that sometimes it kind of needs to be like a, a new a new share. Okay. Uh, okay. One sec. I'm gonna I'm gonna shut one thing down here. Okay. Let's try this. So there you go. Um, so I, normally when I start these tracks, um, if you haven't listened to anything that Mick Gordon has done, uh, he did, he's done all the Doom and Doom Eternal first person shooter games. Um, so if you go online or on Spotify or something and uh, look up the Doom soundtrack, you're gonna get a real quick idea that it's like kind of atonal, 
super dark, uh, just always aggressive, um, and then as gritty as possible all the time. So I kind of took those characteristics, um, and the client wanted something very similar. So I uh, a little bit of background about me is that I'm a drummer first. I uh, I went to school for drumming, so uh, all of my tracks always start with great drums. Um, and luckily, around the time that I was asked to make this track, I uh, got the complete, what is it, 13 update. So it's, um, I was exploring some of the Butch Vig drums, um, and they introduced the new Byte uh, and Dirt distortion plugins, which are fantastic. Um, so I just had, I, the timing worked out really well that I was able to find some really cool stuff to use. So I'm going to start with my drums here. I found a Butch Vig kit that I absolutely loved, and I started with it. Um, and I, I have the MIDI here. If we want to ask questions about it later, I can actually pull up the thing. But for now, I just bounce the audio just so you guys aren't uh, hearing a crackly session. But um, this is the Butch Vig kit. Um, is, is that window actually popping up for you guys? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Uh, so I love the Butch Vig kit. It's real splatty. Uh, the drums are nice and gross. <laughs> and those are two things that are great when you're writing gross, uh, uh, dark music. So this kit that I actually used was the Vinyl 2 Chemical. Um, and uh, here's what the final bounce sounded like. Let me move this window. Uh, there we go. On its own, it's a pretty good kit. Um, I was really having fun with it. What I ended up doing to add more grit to it was I added bite. Um, in this case, I found a preset I really liked, and then I just twi uh, tweaked a lot of the like bit crushing and some of this crunch is like additional overtones. So it's they're very saturated drums. Um, and then I like really punchy transients on my drums. I don't like I don't like to be too. Uh, boring i like everything to be right up in your face so i and i got there by doing obviously some heavy eqing i notched out things i didn't like you'll see on this um that i actually have a resonant frequency at 255 and that was really where the snare was hitting the hardest at the low end so i really pumped that up and then i just wanted some top end on the cymbals overall so i boosted at 5k with a shelf um and then I don't know if everybody knows what Soothe is, but it's really this like interesting multi-band dynamic EQ that will just scoop gross things out of your mix. And there was some really harsh hitting your ear weird, like things in 3K, 4K, and that just got rid of that. And then at the end, I pushed it with a transient designer. Um, so you can see the sustain is a little shorter. I didn't like that the drums on the Bush Vig kit, the transients were nice and uh, punchy, but I felt like the sustain on the shells, like the kick and the snare, were a little too overhanging. Um, and so I put a transient master on there to just tighten up so that the kick and the snare were hitting right where they needed to, and they weren't staying in the way when I've got all these other huge synths happening. Um, and then at the very end, I always put some sort of glue compression on my drums. And in this case, I'm using the uh, JST Bus Glue. I think it's the Joe Wanasek version. I love that. And yeah, it's really not doing a lot, but it's just making sure that you're staying in line. And you'll see when you're trying to compose quickly, that things can get volume wise very quickly out of hand. So I always try to put some sort of just moderating compression at the end of all these builds, just so that when I'm getting to my final mix, I'm not suddenly like getting these crazy peaks and curves that I have to compensate for in the master. Um, so anyway, I, I really like the sound of this kit, but I wanted a little bit more punch out of the snare and kick, uh, especially with all these things happening. So like in the mix. They're, they're nice and right in your face. They're, they're not losing their space. And so I did that by adding an EDM kick underneath, which just gave a little bit more of a sub and a little bit more attack. So it was kind of, kind of the edges of where the, uh, Butch Vig kit was not hitting correctly. Is this uh, is this just two kicks? In essence? Say that one more time. Sorry. Oh, oh yeah, is this just two kicks for the entire drum part? Yeah. Mm -hmm. oh, awesome. Thank you. So uh, 
it's it's a real basic EDM kick. You can hear it. I I I didn't even use processing on it. I just like the sample. Pretty pretty basic sound, you know. So but it, but it you, filled in um, spaces that I needed from the butch kit that wasn't happening. So they filled out each other well. Um, Brian, let me let me get a quick question. Go on, DPP. How did you EQ those or make it so that they weren't conflicting with each other? Uh, one is phase. Um, so in the case of this particular sample, I flipped a phase correctly. So well, number one, I lined them up so that they're, you know, obviously hitting on the same beat. There's no flaming. And then number two, I made sure that the phase was happening correctly. So what I actually did on this one is the phase was inverted from the Butch Vig kit. And, and it's hard to, it's going to be hard to show you now because I've had to balance all my files, but basically it was, it was missing the appropriate frequencies that you would hear in a kick. It's, and you know that when your meter is pumping at full volume and yet you're not really hearing anything, that's a good way to say, maybe there's a phasing issue. Um, and so I did that. I reversed the phase on this kick. So it was going like this and now it's going like this, put simply, um, so that the phases were, were lined up so that when those two are hitting, they're actually complementing each other instead of canceling each other out. Um, so it's, and then the it's same thing on less the an EQ thing than a, um, than a phase thing for you. Yeah. Now the other interesting thing is, um, I, I can't quite remember what I, yes. So I have actually on my, on my drum bus, I have smash and grab, which is a, a, uh, another kind of bus glue compressor. Um, and so sometimes I find that if, if they're just not sitting right, sometimes I just compress them together and see what the tones are that are created. And in this case, it worked out great because the EDM kick is supplying all the low end and the butch big kit is supplying all the character. Um, and then when they were compressed together, they melded nicely because the phases were in shape and they were lining up correctly. So does that help? Yeah, I think cool. so. <laughs> um, so, and then uh, I, I wished that the snare had a little more top into it. It was super splatty. I'll play it again. So then again, I, I found a sample that I liked. So that when they're playing together, especially in this dubstep stuff, it, it's important to get enough layer going that it, it feels like it's got its own space. So together, this is what they did. with the kick in so the, that's pretty much all i did for the kit that was the first thing i did on this song just because i love the butch vig kit um and then what i did later as i was creating is i i like to take the same samples that i made when i'm composing other sections of the song and just apply them with different effects so what I mean by that is this is the exact same kit up here. Um, and all I did was put a bunch of crap on it. <laughs> uh, so so this is the actual kit. But again, you see that I had bite on it. Um, I used the same EQs. And then I ended up using Freak, which is a frequency shifter. Um, so that's where you're getting that like sound. Um, and between all that, it came, gave it a really cool lo-fi effect. So, so it's the same part. I just put stuff on it. And then again, same part, but I, I felt like I needed a little bit more presence to the drums in these lo-fi sections. So I, same part, no kick so that together when they're playing in this intro here, I'll play it. the vibe there um it's i just wanted a little bit of punch but i also wanted some lo-fi so that when this old dub steppy part comes in now i've got a distinguishing factor between especially in the film world people like a lot of dynamic range so that if you if you've got this really cool build you're inspiring the filmmaker to make something really cool happen here and then the drop happens that's when the coolest part of the sequence should be happening for them um, can, I, can i just ask you something real quick 
And I know these sometimes sure. questions are kind of like um, asking somebody, like, how do you breathe? But when, when you make these sounds, I'm always curious about people's approach, their mindset. Are you on autopilot or, um, you know, given all the experience and, and the wealth of mentors and people that you've been around, or are you very tactful and intentional? Like, okay, I want to hear a flutter. I'm going to use this. Do you mind just giving me a, a little bit in terms of your psychology? Sure. I, I think it's a lot like re- learning an instrument where, um, say you're applying a new skill to your instrument. It, it can be very painful. There's a lot of guesswork. There's a lot of experimentation. Um, and the more I've done this stuff, the less I have to think about what I want. So I, I think it's at the end of the day, now that I'm in a very congruent process where I said to myself, I want a frequency ring modulator hitting these drums with a lo-fi. And I knew my plugins, I didn't have to search for it. I just knew what would bring that result. Um, but if you had asked me that question maybe three or four years ago, I would, I would have said, by God, I spent four hours tinkering with random stuff just to try to figure out what would apply for me. So I think it is, maybe it's more a thing of like, I know what my toolbox is. And, and I also know what my sound is. Um, and then it, it, I think also maybe it really helps when you, when you dive into the reference track that you're given by the client and you say, maybe I, it's interesting because I'm hearing this, in this case, like these drums, I'm hearing dirt. I'm hearing a ring modulator happening. Yeah. And so automatically my mind says, oh, okay, well, it's this plugin. It's this plugin. I can press it this way. I can EQ it this way. Good to rock. My uh, favorite composers, you know, people like you that you have, you literally have your own sound. Like mm-hmm. how that's even possible in today's age is, is, uh, is quite an achievement because we know it's not the DAW. We know it's not the plugins. It really is kind of not to get too metaphysical, but you, you know, it's just the the way you do the thing that you do. I just find it fascinating when people get their own sound. So uh, anyway, uh, this is awesome, man. What else you got for us? Yeah, for sure. Um, so uh, drums, I, I just just to round out drums. I found a bunch of samples and I love I love glitch stuff uh, like the flashbulb is one of my favorite guys. So um I just love, as you can hear, it's like uh, some, some of these are splice samples, but I don't like, I don't like just taking a splice sample and dumping it into a track that it, it feels a little lazy to me at this point. So I, I like to find a way to make it my own. And normally I make it my own by adding a bunch of glitch stuff. Um, and in Ableton, there's a thing called beat repeat. Uh, so like, I added beat repeat to these and it automatically glitches out at a certain point given when, when you want it to do it. Um, and, and like you said, Eddie, it's just adding character at that point. Um, I found some can class, I found a bunch of other stuff. Repeat? Like, can you show us like what it's basically doing? Sure. So beat repeat is a pretty wild plugin. Um, let's see, how about I play it on this one? So here's here's the loop. And then I'll, I'll add in these beat repeats and you can hear what they're doing. So basically what it's doing is adding, uh, it's kind of like a beat masher where like it picks whatever sample you put at the target, which in this case was the downbeat of one or the uh of, of one and uh, adds a beat mash to it on that transient. So like if it's a kick, it would go and you can add what type of beat mashing you want to happen. So I have an eighth note happening on that front end. And then I have a 32nd note version happening on the second end. So you, you can see it activate when it comes on. Watch the 32nd one and you'll see it. It's every four bars. So it's just, just adding a little bit of, of, I would say chaos. If, if you're not getting inspired, beat repeat is a really fun way to just like say, let's just see what happens. Cause you can add like a randomizer knob. Um, and the bummer is like trying to get, like say you liked what beat repeat was doing but you have it totally random. You're never gonna get the same sequence again. So sometimes what I like to do is like, if I really wanna just experiment and get something going, I hit, I hit record on a random audio track that's resampling whatever's happening on that track 
so that I'm always capturing the playthrough. And that way, like if if the glitch is totally random, I'll just I'll just grab that one little piece and I'll throw it back in the loop. Nice. Um, so anyway, I, I don't want to stay on drums forever here. So that that's basically the end of the drums, the claps and and uh, the metal, all this stuff. I. Uh, I, I just wanted stuff that made it sound more industrial. Um, and I found those ting tings, ting tings. I think they're a damage loop. Let me look. Yep. Yep. It's just a damage, damage sample that I liked and I, I rolled with it. Um, and uh, in the, in the drop, I just wanted something a little more industrial. So those are popping through. I always make an entire group for just effects. And when I'm composing, after I get a basic foundation down on my form, say I say, all right, I want an intro, I want a pre-intro, I want a drop, I want a pre-chorus, I want a chorus. That's usually my first day of composing is, I always find that I'm most successful if I can get my form down within the first day. Uh, because if you come back on a cool loop the next day, good luck to you. <laughs> I'm turning it into something that's fun. Like all your inspiration is best spent on that first day figuring out what you want to imagine your track to be like. Um, so wait, on that note, because again, I'm always fascinated by psychology. As a drummer, do you write the drums first or not? In, in most cases, yes, because that's what I'm most comfortable with. And I know I can, can see, I can succeed the quickest by writing what I know is going to be the best. Wow, um, you start with rhythmic elements. So the music's in the back of your head somewhere clearly i mean you already kind of know what it's going to sound like uh, yeah but, so and if you think about it in terms of like a band well i've always been in the back of the band or automatically thinking about how my part applies to the track mm. and that's always been my priority when i'm in bands so now that i'm you know composing it's like it's not much different where i i know what i want when i get to it on the on the melodic stuff but first drums are always going to be my top priority um, so, uh, maybe, maybe that could be a downfall or it could be something interesting that gets me work oh. in the future, you know, oh, no. clearly it's working. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to, I'm going to put some of your, uh, your socials from your, your groups, uh, if you don't mind here in the chat. Sure. Cool. Yeah, awesome. do it. I do have a quick um, question cause I, I might've accidentally missed this at the very beginning, but you said, I think you said, um, when you first start that you were, that you take the reference track and you plop it in and then you kind of line up your form with that. Was I mistaken? Sometimes that's that's helpful. Other times I, I can I have to catch myself because they don't necessarily want the same form. They want the vibe. Um, and so honestly, I end up stressing myself out more if I say it has to be this way, no matter what, uh, unless it's a very like high profile client saying, all right, it has to be 60 seconds. You have to do these hits at these moments. That doesn't come through very often. What what more often what they want is you, the composer, to help them inspire to make a great product. So it starts with you creating form that makes you excited about the track. Um, so the way that I made this track, it was like, well, I had a guide, but at the end of the day, I wanted to be excited about what I heard. Um, and so I liked having two long intros, and then I, I liked having two drops, and then I liked having a very loud, annoying chorus. And to me, that just sounded fun. And when I sent it to the client, they said, this is exactly what we're looking for. And bam, the product is being made at that point. So um, it, maybe some notes there. Is, is that helpful? Yeah, I guess I guess that's a segue into like what you were about to say, how you finish your form on day one. Because like, yeah. I'm very curious about this now. So the, the form thing is a big thing to me because I, I don't know, I'd say I'm, I guess around 400, 500 tracks into my career. And I just know that the, the most fun and inspiration I have is the initial point that I write it. So I try not to write tracks after like 6 p.m. because uh, by God, I'm burned out by seven. And so to make a cool loop uh, doesn't leave me with the best chance of success to finish the track out as quickly as I need to. And so normally I'll, I'll put work away at 5 p.m. if I know that I I've got a great idea. It's still going to be a great idea tomorrow, but I will have a better chance at getting it done in more light as I imagined it if I have more time to put into form. Um, so, and, and I do have another track that I, I can pull up after this uh, if we have time. 
but it, it's a lot more la- along those lines of like, all right, I wrote the form in a day and I'll show you how I did it because like, well, I did do rhythm first. <clears throat> I also took chords sec- immediately second and I made my form and then I started building the track out from there. Um, that would be so great. Like, Love to peek out another one if possible. Sure. Well, I can rep through this one and then we can, we can pop over to the other one. Um, it's less mean. <laughs> uh, so uh, I'm a big fan of drones. Um, if, if people ever ask me to bounce my stems out, I always know that they, they like a good drone because if they're going to vamp anything, if they want to talk over it or anything, they, they're always going to take that drone stem that I made and just put that sucker right, right where they needed to. So that that is uh so what i did on that is uh another i added dirt to that i sucked all the low end out of it um side chained it to the kick put some uh reverb on it and i just let it be a thing and that was the actual basis for how i got the chords out of this one interestingly enough this song is pretty much atonal (laughs) um because it's a modal progression and what i mean by that is let me see if i can find the actual let's see so if you can see i moved everything in half steps um and by by most accounts this would not be mm, a melodically structured idea but um something about it comes together when i put that guitar lead over it so uh here i'll, I'll play this full section you can hear it and I'll, I'll keep these uh this midi up so you can kind of witness it happening pretty weird neotonal thing like it if you if you look at the theory of it it's not quite a scale or centered on a pitch but when your ears are hearing it it's 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 something (laughs) so um i i don't know i thought i had a lot of fun with this one because normally when i when i'm writing a track i'll just sit on a keyboard or on my guitar and i'll pluck out these chords sound good together i know what basic music theory is but when i get a chance to make something modal and I would say semi disturbing to a modern ear. Um, that makes me a lot happier. <laughs> so uh, yeah, that was one of those things. So uh, the final thing I really think I, I should talk about is this dubstep drop thing. Um, I get I get a lot of work for these, uh, um, I don't know, I guess kind of grit, chaos grit things going on. And uh, sorry, I'm taking that loop off. All right. Um, and so normally what I'll do, if I need to make like a wild dubstep type track, the first thing I'll do is I'll make the MIDI in one channel. And I don't have it on here, unfortunately, anymore. But basically it looked like one channel here. And then I had the rhythms and the notes that I wanted just on like a basic saw wave happening underneath the drums. And then at that point I separated, I would split the MIDI and I'd say, well, I want this, I want this section on this MIDI and I want this section on this MIDI. Um, and so it's a really refreshing way to split up your audio into a bunch of MIDI, and then you can just find the sounds that you really get inspired by. And so that's exactly what I did here, <clears throat> where I found a bunch of, first I made the MIDI that I liked, and then I made all the sounds that fit under it. Um, and most of these were made in either Massive or Serum. And then I put a bunch of uh, more of that dirt or, um, bite on it. So here I'll play this section again. If you're ever like really in doubt for a for something unique that's going to give you kind of that cutting edge of like 
wow, this is really current and wild. I, I would suggest try that MIDI option. Um, make the MIDI you love and then just make eight separate MIDI channels and split it all up and then see what you come up with. Um, and, and you'll probably be very surprised at, at what you've come up with because it may be something that you never really looked at. Um, all right, just to make sure I understand, you you take a whole drum loop sample and then you throw in like a MIDI sampler and you just chop it up into eight whatever and then that's what you're doing? So so uh, maybe, maybe I can be a little clearer here. Say I say I start with a basic MIDI channel and I wanted, in this case, I just want 16 notes. You could even do it this way. So you got a bunch of 16 notes here, right? And then I make new MIDI channels directly under it. And I say, well, what if I put this? So each of these essentially would be different synths as you start building. And so uh, I like that, that synth being there. And what if we had these two down here? And let's split this one down here. And, and so if you can imagine several, let's say three cents all doing that weird 16 note thing, it's going to sound pretty wild. So it, does that help clarify? Yeah, all with different. So one melody divided a, 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 amongst different sounds. Yeah. Which I yeah. assume would be, would be processing and pan differently and, and that kind of thing. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And each sound gets its own little love, you know, like, uh, here, I'll play this one. That was a, uh, that was a massive patch and you can see it's got dirt and bite on it. You know, each of them, uh, th what's real tricky about this is just making sure that your levels stay consistent. Some of these are spice samples, which again, I, I did my own thing too, cause I just didn't want to take a sample and drop it in with nothing happening. Um, I wanted it to sound something cooler. Um, but normally when I, when I do this route too, I, I will route them all to the same bus. And then I'll put, uh, in this case, the Joel Wanasek uh, keys bus glue on it. And so it's just keeping all of them at the same volume the whole time. Um, and I also put soothe on, but if I turn soothe on, it's going <laughs> to crash the session. So we won't, we won't do that right now. So uh, you're, it's, it seems like you're really big on bus processing. Um, so that's that's really cool. And, and um, I wanted to ask you real quick, in terms of the LUFS, like the loudness, um, where is your reference or where was? And then where do you strive to be in terms of loudness? I, uh, I don't have my entire mastering on, I, but normally for this client particularly, I try to go for negative seven loofs. Luffs, wow. whatever you want to call it. Wow, they get, they yeah, get, it's, they it's pretty hot. <laughs> yeah. Um, but it, you you can see, basically, I have so much EQ notching out those things that are causing... This is a dynamic EQ. Um, I did I did a course way back for you on uh, my mastering chain, and I've got OTT, which is just... And you know, I'm getting everything real locked in, and then I squash it to death with Ozone 8 on that maximizer. Um, let's see if it'll pull up. Yep, there it is. It it's sitting at negative seven. I don't know if it's gonna play that well right now. It, Ozone is a super oh, no, it's all good. It sounds great already. I can only imagine. Um, yeah. Last question for me: um, Dirt and Byte are also NI plugins. Yes, DBP. Uh, that's in the chat. Um, last thing, I'm just really curious. I know you talked about your kind of initial inspiration day, which is kind of when you throw all the ideas on paper. But typically, and I know this is general, but how long does it take you to complete a, a track, like just on average? I, I normally take about three days, but from start to final mix to get a track in and out. And are we talking like a, a solid eight hour day? I just, I, you know, I always ask these questions because you'd be surprised how much it actually helps other people. Because when they see somebody, they can model the behavior, they can kind of model their success and then find their own version of it. But so like first day is inspiration. Second day is kind of putting it all together. And then third day is finalizing, I assume, or something to that degree. That, that's usually pretty much it. Now I, um, my normal day is I, I work, I wake up, I do a good workout and then I come home and I practice guitar or drums for usually two to three hours every day before Just I start. Work. Wow. You get in the zone. I love it. Yeah. Well, and I personally, I just found that I, I'm not as creative if I'm not applying on an instrument first. Um, and, it, and it'll show in my work, like I'll, if I just try to skip all that and go right into work, I, I have 
the cloudiest mind. I can't put chords together. I don't like my leads. So mm. to get my brain creative and working before work, it, it's always done wonders for me. So cool. And then while we're on this note, do you take a day off or not? Right now, I haven't taken a day off just because COVID has made things a little chaotic. But I, if I feel like I've earned a day off, um, I usually take Saturday totally off. I'll go get ice cream and I'll shut my phone off and uh, <laughs> play video games for six hours, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> but it, at this point in, in time, I, you know, we've talked, you and I have talked a little bit about this, but it, we're at a point where like you, you need to be thinking ahead as far as you can. And, and there is a threshold where you know that you're okay. Um, but it just in terms of how last year went, like the gr the grind is going to stay the grind for a minute for me, um, just to really make sure that I've, I've diversified myself and I'm staying in what I love. So I love it, man. Well, let's take a quick peek at this, uh, this other track and then we'll, uh, were there any other questions on, uh, on that track? What, what was that for? Was that for a video game you said or for a movie or? Um, this was, this client has asked me to write a bunch of dungeon music. Um, <laughs> and so I've been, I've been hired for uh, X number of songs upon delivery to get paid, you know, and, and each track they have different requests. Um, and so on that one, they sent me the doom soundtrack and said, can you, can you please copy this? And in their case, they're they're kind of a catalog based client and they know that they don't have X happening in their catalog and they might be losing work out of it. So they'll hire me to do certain songs that other people aren't replicating. Well, you know, the guy the guy writing future bass isn't going to pull out a doom dungeon track very well. So, um, yeah, no, knowing your market also helps, I guess. So this is kind of a drum and bass one. Uh, the reference track that was sent to me. I was going to pull up it. I, I'm not going to play it on here just because I don't want to get flagged. Um, but it's by a, an artist called Party Favor. And it's called Social Distance Sunsets. And it's basically just a nice drum and bass track. Um, I may have to shut off Ozone. But why, why don't I just play you the, the main tag here? And, uh, and then I'll talk through a little bit of it. Let's go. This one's a little different than the other one. Uh, so um, in this case, I knew that it was drum and bass. So I started with drums. Um, and so what I what I really did is the first day I, I wanted to say, all right, if I'm going to do this big drop, because if you listen to the party favor track, it, it's building for like two minutes and then it kind of explodes. But the, it's drum and bass, but it's not like hard drum and bass. It, it, there's a different, I guess you, you might call it like jungle drum and bass. I'm, I'm not really sure. Um, I'm not good with the sub genres. Um, so anyway, I, I really liked, I built a kit. You can see the MIDI here. Um, and uh, and I, I froze it, but here. So that was my that was my original idea on this track because um, I didn't want the drums to be super heavy. They shouldn't be taking the lead. They should feel good, but they shouldn't be taking the lead. Um, and so I a after I really started digging in on the chords, I decided that I should add a sub to the kick. So I've got this dude. Uh, sorry. You can see on the sampler that I made it really short and I really just wanted a, a quick blip on that like 60 hertz to 100 hertz area. 
which wasn't being represented well by the other kit. Um, so that filled it out. And then I really felt like the snare just needed a little more weight to push. So then again, I, I sampled over the top there. So. You can hear it. Um, basically what I did is I took another snare. I shortened the transient a little bit. I'm sorry, just the sample itself, just so it's a little quicker. And you can see I made some wild EQ moves on it. Um, I used smash and grab to compress it. And then I put a nice, uh, I would say medium sized room on it. One, one thing that I always say to, to people that ask me like, what, why do your drums sound the way they sound? And if I'm as a drummer, if I hit a drum, and it sounds bad, I'm going to hate that drum. I'm going to play worse. And, and people aren't going to re respond to it that well. So I like to think about all my drums and all my compositions. Does it sound like it would it would happen in real life? Um, and granted, it's a sample. But imagine like taking a stick and hitting something. Would it feel good to hit that? And in this case, yes. Sounds, sounds pretty meaty. Like I would enjoy hitting that snare, you know. Um, to, to, your, to your point, sorry if I'm interrupting, but I got a question. No, no, you're good. Drums are everything. Any advice for non-drummers to better their chops in the DAW? I would say one is parallel compression is, is pretty serious. Um, and what I'm doing here is I, I have the uh, slate red and that sucker's uh, banging. Well, let's see. So there it is. Um, and here it is without it. It's like 5% less life in it. You know what I mean? So here it is. Oh, yeah. And, and everybody has their favorite way of doing parallel compression. I've heard a lot of metal guys like, like to just smash the transient. So you're getting a lot of sustain out of the parallel compression. I, I don't personally like that because I like to get that that clip, like, like, like I said, like a drummer is really hitting it. Um, and so I do that by having a, a pretty slow attack. I like to get the transient through the compressor. And then I like to have the compressor just touch it and then send it right back out with as, with as fast a release as possible. Um, and again, you, it, this could be totally taboo by some people's standards, but by God, I love the way it sounds. So it works. Uh, it works. yeah. So, um, and then the other important thing is when you're doing uh, parallel compression, do not compress the low end of all your samples. Um, that's why I like the FG Red. Um, it's got this high pass filter. And so you can see that like 50 Hertz is pretty much untouched on these. So you're getting a really good press on like 70 Hertz up. And that way all your snaps are getting hit without ruining the sub of, of like a kick or a tom. Um, if that makes sense for everybody there. So that's important. The other thing to me is when, when you're, you don't, you don't parallel it, compress your kicks at all. I do parallel compress the kicks. I didn't end up needing to on this one just cause that sample was massive. Um, and I had smash and grab on this sub kick. So it's already compressed. Um, you gotta be careful with over compressing drums because you get all transient and no low end. If you're over compressing, um, if that's intentional. Great. But normally, like, like I said, like the mark of an amateur is somebody that's compressed their drum so much that like the transient is over here and the depth of that drum is over here. So like when you're hearing it come through your ear, you can hear it and then a, oh, that's that's the mark to me of like somebody that doesn't know their drums. When you want a good sounding kit, you need to have your sub and your transient hitting as close as possible all the time. And that goes for snare, toms, kick, even your hi-hat. If you've got a weird hi hat where you've got a tick and then you've got this air thing happening after, it just it doesn't sound like it actually would. Because you you're not like as a drummer, I wouldn't be playing in a pipe. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like I wouldn't I wouldn't hit my drums in a pipe and hear the transients come back at me a second later. I that when I'm playing my kit, it's happening all right in front of me. And then when that mic's happening, you're hearing a kick with a sub at the same time hitting you at a rock concert. Um, and that's what you love about your drums. So uh, there, that's really how you make a sound, sound foundation. Um, and then the one other thing I would say for anybody really trying to get out of amateur world is figure out, a, figure out a reverb. 
every time for every drum. And what I mean by that is like, it doesn't have to be a huge reverb. Why don't I, why don't I put it on uh, this dude? For every drum. Every drum. Every drum deserves some type of reverb. It doesn't have to be so heavy that you hear it. Right. But in terms of like, what if what if you were even tracking a drum in a stereo room, uh, a basic mixing tracking room, you would still have a, rev a reverb happening within those 10 feet walls, you know, mm. and, and that's what I want to capture every time I use my kicks and stuff. Um, and, it, and it's just that one percent to me that adds up to meaning you've got something that that is special that other people aren't doing. So in, in terms of like the sub kick, let's. Uh, so this one already had a little bit of reverb on it. I have a send to a, a verb here, and I like this one, drum depth. I, I don't know how well that's coming across. Yeah, I'm it's, not, it, it's not a lot. But but if you were in a real room, you would hear that happening, right? Right. If, if we were at a concert hall or even just a garage. Yeah. Uh, quick question on the chat here. Different verb for every drum or same verb, different send amounts? I mean, I guess it would depend. Sometimes, but... sometimes I will use the same verb for a whole gr group. Um, in this case, I really like to add bigger ambience to snares. Mm. So I always use a medium to large room on a snare. I always use a short verb like what I what I just showed you on the kick where it sounds like it's in a studio. Um, and then the toms, I usually use a, a medium to small room as well, because the, the low end with a large room really starts to get messy. So I want the attack to have the transient on the lower stuff, uh, the attack to have the reverb showcased on the on the lower end frequency stuff. And on the yeah. snare, I really like that high wispy tone going on. So well, hold on. Let me let me re reiterate. That. I think that was you said bigger ambient verb for snares, and then the other two were uh, a short, like a small to medium drum room. For for kicks or just everything else? For kicks and toms, I would say. Okay, cool. Um, in in hi hats, it usually depends on the vibe, like cymbals. If you really want a washy mix, like on this one, I really wanted some like overtones happening. So I I did actually add a pretty breathy room on this one. Let's see what I added. So this one has a 1.2 sustain. The size is pretty pretty large. Um, and so here's what it sounds like. But the role of those hi-hats wasn't to be in your face and pokey. They're, they're just there to add ambience to the whole track. Um, so that that's really up to you. How big do you want your drums to sound is based on what the sizing is. Um, and in this track, it's larger than life. So I used larger than life reverbs. If you were, you, you know, doing an indie rock band or something, I'd be very sparing on how big you want those reverbs to get. Um, otherwise, it sounds unrealistic and, and it just doesn't resonate right at that point. Bro, this is this is literal gold. <laughs> <That's> amazing. <laughs> the psychology, the approach. I think part of it's because you're a drummer. Obviously, you're very, you have a high musical IQ, but geez, man, this is awesome. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm glad I'm helping. Um, are there other questions on the drums? I think, I mean, to round it out real quick, I just had... Um, I had a tambourine on the second half just because I wanted some elevation. So an interesting thing that I like to do on these like real high wispy things is I always try to add some sort of panning effect um, I don't enjoy hearing like hi-hats and tambourines directly down the center. And again, that goes with like, if you're hearing a real drum kit, you probably hear the hi-hat over this way and you hear the ride cymbal over this way. Um, and when you're trying to make really powerful kick and snare and you have a hi-hat screeching down the middle with your kick and snare, that's not helping anybody. So what I've done on this is I've added auto pan. And you can hear it, well, if we're in mono, you probably can't hear it. But basically what it's doing is just doing this in time on the stereo field. And that way it's never touching where the snare and the kick need to have the most weight. Um, and I, I do that quite a bit, just so I have some some more width to my track too. Like, I, you know, having all your drums panned in mono doesn't necessarily always fit the vibe. Sometimes it might. Um, but in this track, like I, like I said, I want it larger than life. I want wide drums, and that's done by having a lot of cool percussion happening on the sides and the kick and snare right down the middle. Um, 
I think that's about it on drums. So when I was making this track due to the prior point, I, I recognized the chord progression happening in the other track. And it was uplifting. It's not heavy. It's not aggressive. And immediately when I hear it at this point, I think, well, these are like feel good vibes, you know, team building videos, you know, things like that. Uh, the pastors coming up today or, you know, just things where it's like, it's real light and happy. Um, and so I went through and I, I played a few keys in on, on my actual keyboard of what I liked. Um, just kind of out of time, trying to, trying to wind out what I liked. Um, and so the first chord pass I made was right here. And this is after you determined your form. This was while I was determining form. So first things first, I made that drum loop that I, that I felt was fitting of where I wanted it to go. And then I went directly to these chords and I made the chords because then I can fit my bass under that. And then I can figure out form based on where I want, you know, you've got this eight bar loop and it's like, okay, what, once, once you have that done and it's, it's affecting you emotionally in a positive way, you could just move that anywhere you wanted. Uh, you have your key set up, you've got all that stuff. So, um, yeah, so I, that was the first loop I made. Um, and then I started just stacking the crap out of the synths because I wanted a lot, a lot of like breathy kind of synth wave sound happening. So I got this piano. Which had some good sustain to it, just happening. Um, I had I wanted transient happening, so that's why I've got a pluck happening. Um, I think I've got another pluck here. Nope. Okay, these would be like the EDM chords. What I, what I really envisioned for this one was kind of like uh, waves of the chords instead of just like holding a chord and sitting on it for the whole. Uh, what is it? Four counts that's active. I wanted it to happen and fade away. Um, so I picked everything that kind of was shorter. And then anything that is sustaining is low. So you know that the chord is still operating, but it's not in your way. Um, so you can see I have like 400 layers happening. And then I took, uh, at that point, I wanted a little bit more movement happening under over those chords. So I took the same chord pass, and I, I always do this. At this point, if I want more movement, I'll take that same chord pass that I made, and I'll, I'll just put Omnisphere or something that has like a cool arpeggio uh, option on it. And, I'm, and what I came up with was this. It's kind of chaotic, but, but in the context, it's not really doing a lot, so. Adding that movement that the listener is going to appreciate as like forward momentum, which would be the, the vibe of the track. And then I also wanted something organic just because it felt a little too digital and EDM to me. So I found this mandolin loop. And it's not even changing pitch the whole time. It's literally just staying on the root note, which I think in this track was uh, G. So, and, and again, it's real subtle, but, um, I just wanted some like humanization and just like that 16 note thing rolling through the whole thing. Okay, I'm gonna lose a, a not full lead over the top. So then I went through and I I programmed a guitar and some bells which are just outlining the tops of the chords. So it feels like, like there's somewhat of a lead happening, but you're not just like playing crappy chords. Um, so in the context, it, it feels like it's when this actually hits after the buildup, like here, I'll show you just like a few bars before. I have all my chords figured out. Then I went to the bass. And this was the last thing before I started really getting my form done. Um, 
and I really like Reese bases. Uh, so like first base I pulled up was this one. Which I made an iris, isotopes iris. Then I wanted I wanted something that would help that like wash of chords to happen. And I normally do that by like if I want it in the bass. I find a way to make sure that the res the res of a bass is happening and it's enveloping down every time it hits. So I made this dude in silence. Here's this kind of resing down. And then together they're, you know. Uh, the final thing I did was now that I have all these parts programmed because I literally just took the chords I made at the beginning and I cut them down to a baseline here. Um, now that I have all this MIDI figured out, I have all the chords, I have a drum beat figured out, then I, I figured out my form and I did that by saying, all right, I just want one drop in this because I, it doesn't make sense to have like a double drop in, in like these. Can you, can you define tracks. what you mean with drop? Like I think of it like a breakdown, like where everything comes out or like, or when the beat drops back in, but I think you mean something different. Yeah. Well, and, the, and the, you're right. You're right on that. Um, I feel like when, like in a band context, so if somebody said drop to me as a drummer, I would drop out. But in the context of like EDM, the drop to me is always like it came from like dubstep when they would be like, oh, get ready for the drop. And the drop is the biggest section of the track. The, the, this is the, the issue with our industry is all these <laughs> terms just fly around and people are so irresponsible. Um, so, yeah, we have to kind of, you know, when I first started, everybody was like, this is a, this is a stem. This is a sub. This is a sting. And it was just like, who's right here? You know, so anyway, but yeah, it's all contextual. Absolutely. Um, and now that you've heard it, you're going to, you're going to reference it again. If somebody says, and they're talking about EDM and you say drop you, I mean, you automatically are going to say, Oh, okay. You mean like the biggest section of the track where the, where um, the shit goes crazy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm, yeah. So I wanted, I wanted pretty much that. And I wanted the lead. I found this little lead that I liked and I, that was really where I started shaping the track to be done. And so I had this whole thing. And to me, the easiest way to get your form going is once you find that lead that you like, figure out how to put it lo-fi in the front. <laughs> so uh, that's that's all this is, you know. We're, so. And, and literally, I took the chords that I used, and I, I just cycled them on the one, this the first chord, the down the the root chord, which is a G in this case. It's it's not doing anything fancy. And and to me, I knew that the building and the inspiration thing was like, all right, let's let's get it to a point where we can then explode the track and the drop. So I had a what I like to call a faux drop, which I build to this point and then I drop it out so that one more time we can do a ramp up. So we start building here and now we get to the actual, the actual drop. In terms of form, that was good. And then I and then I thought, well, the intro has already set up this thing where I've got the lead happening lo-fi. So I figured after the drop, I would just reiterate the lo-fi lead one more time, just to reiterate the thought. And normally in filmmaking world, you know, this is where things start fading down in the in the uh, action of the film. You know what I mean? Or or the commercial or whatever. 
So as you want things to wind down, I literally just took the lo-fi lead and I put it back at the end. Pretty much the same too, but I just cut out all the heavy EDM drums. So pretty easy. I, and this is a this is a very classic track where like you find a good eight bar loop and you just cycle the crap out of that dude. You you find a good build with it. You run it once, twice in the big section, and then you recycle it one more time, lo-fi, and boom, it's done. People love it. So well, we love it, man. What a phenomenal track. Thank you so <laughs> much. This is awesome. Uh, any final uh, uh, on the comments? Thank you, Brian, for sharing your wisdom with us. Angelina says, sorry, I'm scrolling up. Awesome ideas and material. I'm going to have to watch back this one again. <laughs> There's like so many gems that, you know. So anyway, we really appreciate you, man. Uh, Julian says so many gems here. Uh, any final questions? I'll open it up. Otherwise, we're closing. And good. Okay, uh, hold on. Yeah, okay, good. All right, hey, thank you so much, bro. Uh, Absolutely. Much love, much respect. You're welcome any and all time. Uh, just a quick idea before we go. Uh, when we linked up back when, uh, you were talking extensively about Reese bases, and I don't know if you're ever uh, you know, open to doing something like that for us, but uh, if you guys don't know about Reese bases, they really make uh, – in fact, your track just had one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, how does that sound to you maybe for the for the next round? Yeah, sure. I'd be down. Cool. All right. Well, we're going to sign off. Thank you very much. Everybody, let's uh, let's give this man a hand. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for thank having you. me. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. That was awesome, thank bro. You, thank, thank you. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right. Happy Wednesday, y'all. Take care. Thanks, Brian. Yeah, thanks, man.